Thanks, Tracy. Um, it's Karen Daniels. So my question to the panel is about protecting embedded researchers because um, I hadn't really thought about the term. And then I, as you were talking, I remembered the second project that I was in at the MRC, and I realized the person we were working with was an embedded researcher. But this person was a registered nurse in the wine village. And she had started a project with lay health workers to support TB. Um, and then somehow it came to the MRC, and so then it got scaled up from 20 lay health workers to a big RCT. And she moved from being a registered nurse who had started this project to being the project manager. So in effect, she was no longer working in the services because she was just project managing this huge um, project. But she suffered a huge amount of emotional turmoil. Um, I suspect one of the issues was that people, there were, probably was a bit of jealousy that she wasn't, you know, one of the nurses in the mobile clinics anymore, going out, that she did something quite special. But there was also, because it was quite a um, politically contentious um, setting in the Winelands, I mean, so there was a lot of, you know, changes, political fluctuations. Um, and so her bosses didn't always like it. And in the end, the buy-in, even though the RCT could show that there was change. The actual buy-in um, for the idea politically didn't take off. Um, and so there was a lot of, I mean, there were 70 hours of the time that she had a lot of burnout, etc. And I do wonder, you know, when we talk about this also in terms of where the person is placed, because she wasn't at the most senior level, she was just a registered nurse, she wasn't a decision maker, a policy maker, um, yeah, so the question is, how do we protect people um, mm -hmm. under those circumstances? Okay. And let's take a few comments before we open up to our panel. Um, Please introduce yourself. Yeah, my name is Mutlaj. Um I just want to get clarity with regard to issues of secrecy conducting this embedded research and publication. Um, is there a separate route that is proposed or we'll just go the same route of uh, you know, public, uh, pub, uh, publishing the outcome of, uh, of this particular research? And secondly, there's a book that is currently circulating. Um, is it Paul's book? Uh, maybe with regard to these issues of research, how do we classify that kind of a book? Thank you. Yeah, my name is Moses. I, don't have a name. And I have both a comment, but also <coughs> it is a question in itself also. We are thinking, we've been talking about embeddedness in itself, but also, we also talk a lot about objectivity and losing it and so on. I'm wondering how we can talk about um, embeddedness, but also think of keeping objectivity in, in the process. And, and I know that um, um, uh, subjectivity and reflexivity is very much with qualitative research and systems research. But also, I mean, if, if you think about quantitative research, you can do this for, for embedded research as well. Is it time for us to begin to reflect on how um, we think about objectivity in a different way um, with this kind of research? I mean, you can do quantitative research but be embedded in it, and then you have to reflect on how, whether you want to be objective and how you, you bring that out in, in, in the findings. And, and think of it not as a loss, but a positive. Okay, our esteemed panel, the protection of researchers and the emotional turmoil. Any takers? <laughs> Charles? <laughs> yeah, um, I'm not sure whether I, I get, I'll, I'll, I'll have to comment on that protection. 
but also make a comment on uh, uh, Moses' comment, mm. because I think I will see the answer. Mm. I think that uh, embedded research uh, and work uh, requires uh, leadership. Uh, if you don't have the right leadership, it becomes very difficult to handle the protection uh, as well as to, to put up values and ethos that will guarantee the flexibility and other, other values. Um, uh, one of the, the problems that we, 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 we have is that we, sometimes we get involved in activities and, and we don't put a dashboard. Where are we going and why? So in my view, I think that uh, um, embedded research requires uh, leadership that is legitimate. What do I mean? The leaders and the leader or the leaders themselves must have the relevant knowledge set skills. Uh, uh, that defines what is their niche, what is the niche of others, what are the connecting bridges. And then you create an environment that is called values uh, and, uh, and, and ethos, such as flexibility, uh, team building, enabling environment, network mapping and network management, so that you can, to some extent, at least uh, deliberate ideals and ideas to guarantee that protection. Mm. If that doesn't happen, uh, often that's where the problem is. And I share this from my own experience in Zambia, mm. and where uh, I, I think uh, I, I basically had to, with my colleagues, put up a strategic plan for public health-related research mm. that was going to guarantee this. Have a team and show to the team members that each one has a role, and an important role. And, and together as a team, we're able to protect each other. Mm. Thank you. So Charles, what, what I'm reading from what you're saying is that it almost requires quite a bit of lead time if you are going to do embedded research to in order, I mean, there's one thing to capacitate your own team, but to also capacitate the team that you will be doing the way you will be embedded. Because if you're saying things like, you know, the leadership itself needs to have the skills to understand. And just to, to Karen's um, case study that she's just put here, the question is, you know, what was the, the, the engagement with that leadership and that management for them to understand these things that you're saying about roles and responsibility, where they fit in, what the benefits have been, et cetera? Is, is that what you're saying? That almost needs to, as we, as we do our research projects, put enough time for the engagement with the organization itself, and like what Tunyani was saying, it's not just requesting permission anymore. Is that what you're saying? That's what I'm saying. Uh, yeah, truth. Certainly, that's what I'm saying. That we need to have ways to engage. But the second thing I'm saying is that by the time a problem is arising, mm. you should realize that there are missed past opportunities mm. that uh, should have happened. Mm. Uh, to, to some extent, try to avoid that. Mm. Uh, I'm seated here, I'm talking, and uh, I have a young lady, uh, Chama, who is just beginning to do her PhD. For me, this is a uh, capacity government, you know, in a diffusing manner. I believe that 15 years from now, 20 years from now, Chama should be able to know the value of embedded research. Mm. She doesn't need to wait for that 20 years, 20 years a challenge. So this a deliberate effort to capacitate mm. must happen uh, <coughs> passively mm. and actively, mm. but and it we should make it as part mm. of our norm mm. because sooner or later we'll meet these challenges. Mm. Definitely. Okay. Any other comments, particularly on Mo on Moses's issue around maybe we need to rethink how we look at being objective, what objectivity is? Do you want to comment, uh, Walter? Yes, uh, the issue uh, with that is uh, what you're trying to get out of the out of the region itself, mm -hmm. and also what is understood by objectivity, being objective. Mm -hmm. And and I was when when Mosa was doing the the example, I was thinking of what investigative researchers do. Mm -hmm. For them, what we make of the objectivity is that you can verify the information that your sources are provided. Mm. If it's verifiable, for instance, some of the studies that, that we collaborate with some journalists, they did about 
the corruption in the social security system in, the, in acquired drugs for cancer treatment. Mm. So they just present the report, mm. and then the authorities verify that yes, that the information is here, and that's all this, and even a legal case was open on there. Mm. So in that case, they, you, they use all anonymous sources. Mm. So when Moses was asking, I was thinking, okay, are, are you referring Moses because they, they are anonymous sources, because they are insiders, or why are you referring by being objective? If it's because they're anonymous, it's not a, a, a people with a name that can verify. Well, the information came here, but the structures that they describe in the investigative report mm. are verifiable. Mm. So in that sense, it is subjective because it's verifiable, the, the information. Mm. It's not only gossip, for instance. Mm. Mm. So in that sense, I think it will depend whether we want to, well, what we perceive or how do we think the, the criteria of being objective. Mm. And based on that, uh, yes, social sciences, even journalism, mm. have many, many approaches to, uh, to deal with issues of mm. objectivity. Mm. So you've started kind of answering Motlati's question about um, you, don't, you, you don't know um, Jacques, Jacques Paul, which is a, a book that was released in our country, which is from a, an investigative journalist. And so what you are saying in that regard is that you would classify as a, a objectivity, even yes. from an investigative journalist, yes. if the facts that they're presenting yes. on the table care are verifiable. Yes, and, and just to add on that, in our experience, the most important barrier that can give us, but you know, that can help us to go a step away in terms of doing research about health systems and policies is actually journalists, mm. working with journalists. Mm. Mm. Because they do a very, they have different approach, for instance, they, they don't have to go through, through an, an IRB committee that is very much biomedical view doing research. Mm. They have different approaches. Of course, they also follow ethics and all of that. It's a different approaches. Mm. So I, I think the, the step ahead, mm. if we can manage to have stronger collaborations with uh, journalists, mm. it could be it mm. could be very helpful for health policy and system research. Mm. Isn't that problematic, though, if we have almost different standards for investigative journalists versus researchers? Because if I'm reading what you're saying, that if I then say, no, I'm just talking to you because I'm a journalist, I have different rules of engagement versus if I come to you and I say I'm talking to you as a researcher, I could be asking you the same question, but I have diff there are different rules of, of engagement. Is that yes. not problematic? No, I, in, my, in, in my view, if you want to get to where the real problems are, it's mm. not problematic. I mean, okay. it is problematic that we have this very rigorous uh, structure of doing research which is based on biomedicine. And in mm. my view, it doesn't apply, it does not fit mm. for doing health policy and system research. Mm. Mm. But that's the one that we have to use. In my view, we should either mm. try to use the structure that social sciences yeah. you know, or political sciences yeah. uses, even journalism, mm. instead of continuing with this rigid uh, framework of trying to do health policy and system research under a biomedical yeah. framework. Miguel, do you have a perspective? Uh, about that or yeah. about Moshe's? Oh, if you do, or you can, you can answer one of the other questions about secrecy and publications. Could you pass him the mic? Uh, because I'm not sure if Moshe was referring to that. What, uh, I think he, well, my understood was that he was, uh, <laughs> he was referring to, um, to how objective can you be yeah. doing this and being an insider uh, in a particular research. I think that was, uh, that's the way I understood the, the mm. question. Mm. And, and, and as has been mentioned, and it was shown in the, I think, in the slides as well, that um, that it requires an extra effort. Mm. I mean, to, to uh, in, mm. in terms of self critique and self reflection, if you do, you are an insider compared to if you are maybe an insider. You need that too, but I think if you are an insider, you will need an extra, mm. uh, yeah, mm. an extra point there in order to have. Uh, and one, I think, one way of solving that is that, I mean, that usually as well the insiders are collaborating with outsiders. Mm. And it says that uh, they are doing research in collaboration with, uh, with people from maybe university or other centers, mm. uh, and therefore they can, they can question many of the things that are happening in, mm. in that. Mm. Uh, Rajani, do you have a comment on, on the protecting of researchers when they are embedded into the system? <laughs> Well, I'd like to first respond to the objectivity. Sure. I think one way of doing that is we have tried this triangulation 
is using the data yeah. that comes from this kind of research versus generally in implementation research or health in implementation work, you have observations coming from either implementers or policy makers or program managers about certain events or anecdotes in the field. And then using the research to triangulate those findings or to disprove something mm. is a way of dealing mm. with the objectivity mm. issue. Mm. And in terms of protecting researchers in the field, I think I tend to agree with Charles on that one, is that one has to plan for this, mm. not let people be isolated and make them be very much part of the substratum within which they are operating. Mm. Thank you. Tulane, the issue on secrecy and publication, or you can also co add your your voice to the other questions, but that one in particular? No, I think the, the issue of uh, secrecy and publications is, is very clear. Um, the state is what it calls classified documents. So uh, those ones are out of reach, out of bounds, straightforward. Um, the issue of publication is that you, you, you will publish information that you have appropriately accessed. And the issue I want, also want to add is about raising matters internal, meaning sharing your research. You are an embedded researcher. Mm. You are working within the system. Mm. So you arrive at a set of findings. findings. It's best that you share those findings internal because you are working with the system, mm. within the system, not with the system, within mm. the system. Mm. Share them internally as much as you share them perhaps with the institution, the academic institution that you are you are working with. Mm -hmm. the, the famous book, or the notorious book that is in circulation, it's not embedded research. It's not part of embedded research. Is what you described as investigative journalism. Mm -hmm. It's outside of any government system. It's looking inside. Mm -hmm. So whoever might have shared information to the person, it's a different story, but that's not embedded research. Mm -hmm. It would have been better to say if the, the researcher or the journalist mm. was chief director for communication <laughs> some department. Mm. Yeah. Mm. So that's, mm. the, that's, that's the, the, the distinction. But you, you, you take a conscious decision. Mm. You, know, you are asked for information by a journalist. Mm. You are not the spokesperson of the department. Mm. There are people who are designated to release information. Mm. And that is the error. Mm. And the spokespersons know ethic standards of journalism and the ethics of journalism. Mm. And they know how and when to release information. Mm. As you are inside the department and a, a researcher comes and asks you for information, they're going to ask you to sign informed consent. Mm. In that informed consent form, they explain exactly what you are consenting to. Mm. Secondly, they will tell you exactly how they are going to use the information that you are providing. Mm. So the difference between this scientific field of endeavor mm. Mm. is the other process of data gathering is that the other one is regulated by very clear mm. standards which mm. are common and which mm. are well known. Mm. So, so that's that. Um, again, on the issue of, 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 of protecting research, there's a term that Charles used, I think he said lone range. Mm. Mm. So, what it meant is that when we undertake this type of work, let us collaborate with others. Mm. And let others who are in charge of processes and decisions in whatever settings we are working be aware mm. of what we are doing. And as any information, findings, results become available, keep them informed mm. each step of the way. Because if you are a lone ranger, like Charles mm. has said, mm. When the time for fingers to be bent, you're going to bend alone. <laughs> <laughs> but if there's a collective finger bending, yeah. then it's a, it's a different story. On the issue of objectivity, just my, my, my last point, I think mm. Moses is, is absolutely correct. Mm. But it starts with the objectivity of the researcher. Because in embedded research, you are going to discover things about yourself, about your organization. And you are supposed to document them, those are your findings. Mm. But they are reflecting, they might be reflecting badly on you. But this is also a question of leadership. Yeah. You know, your leadership has to be mature enough uh, to receive both positive and negative feedback yeah. to improve the system. And as a researcher, as well, we need to be 
objective. Thank you. Thank you. Some more perspectives? Helen, Jill, David? Um, so we're having a conversation here about embedded research. Mm. Um, and uh, that assumes that there's something called non-embedded. <coughs> um, and having put all of you on the spot and said, you, would you talk about embedded research? I'd like to ask you what you consider to be non-embedded. Um, and, you know, if embedded research, we sort of agree, is, is some kind of public good. I mean, it's not uncomplicated. What is non-embedded research? And who are non-embedded researchers? And what role would it play? Mm -hmm. um, so, and uh, accepting Tulani, I mean, you've got one particular view of what is embedded and not. Mm -hmm. People might regard it as more along a continuum, actually, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that it's not either or. Mm -hmm. So assuming embedded research involves a long-standing engagement within particular contexts, mm -hmm. um, what, what would be the role of, of non-embeddedness and, and what is it, really? Mm -hmm. Let's start this side, Jill. Yeah, I just wanted to um, add in something that I didn't quite get to in the presentation, which is, um, uh, Miguel, your, your reaction was interesting for me, which was a bit of a, oh, we're doing it anyway, you know, what, what is the point, what is the point of the conversation? And I think what is, that is reflecting is that um, what the literature shows is that in the higher income country settings, this is pretty much, the, the, this is what they do, this is mm. the capacity, there is capacity for this, for this type of engagement. Mm. I think what the Alliance has been arguing is that in lower to middle income country settings, it's not. Um, it, it's not even a, an, an issue that ministries of health would consider to be a viable area to put funding towards. Mm. And I think part of what they are trying to argue is that, you know, that, that ministries of health should be considering this an important and engaging area that they should be trying to build capacity for. Mm. Um, so I just want to put that in the pot in the sense of, you know, there is a, in my understanding, there is quite a strong difference between this approach and the capacity for this kind of, mm -hmm. kind of approach in high income and low income settings. Mm -hmm. Okay, David, behind you, John. Thanks, uh, David Sanders. So, thanks for an interesting panel. I want to actually take off from where Jill's just gone, get away from this issue of ethics. So, as I understand it, the purpose of this, or the primary purpose, is to improve health systems function. So maybe it's not the same thing, but we, we used to call this participatory health system research. So now there's a new term. So um, the, I mean, in theory, this is very, very powerful. But experiences that I've had and colleagues have had uh, is that often its power is limited by the, I suppose, the differential uh, power that the researchers and those who are the practitioners and the policy makers have, both in terms of seeing the relevance of this research and uh, having the capacity to participate equally and especially having the power to influence change in the system as a result of the research. So there's been in South Africa over the last few decades, especially the last decade, a lot of research like this done uh, on different health programs, on uh, <coughs> functioning the system in terms of all sorts of aspects. And yet, um, often, those who are participating with the researchers seem unable to actually use that to affect change. Not always, but often. So I'd like the panel to talk about this. The, the issue of who has power in this bed that they all embedded in? <laughs> and uh, how, do you, how do you change that? Mm. You know, what kind of capacity development is necessary? Mm. What sort of um, governance regime 
is necessary. Mm. How open do health systems need to be to this? And I suspect that in general, in high-income countries, there is more openness to this, and research is seen as a legitimate part of health service improvement. Thank you. Lucy, did I oh, so Uta? Uta and Lucy? And then we'll see how we'll let our part. Was there another hand? Okay, Popo. Um, I wanted to briefly comment on the conversation about objectivity um, and take issue with the idea that there is, that quantitative research is objective. Um, I think it's a, simply a fallacy. Um, none of us who are doing research or who are using research or who are engaged with, with information are value, paradigm, or anything else um, free. So the way we ask questions in quantitative research, for example, is of course very, very much um, shaped by what, how we understand the world, what yeah. we think are important questions, and so on. Yeah. So that's not, that stands in the way of objectivity. So I think the quick, it, it is much more important to ask questions of rigor, of validity, mm. of generalizability of within quantitative research rather than questions of objectivity. Mm -hmm. um, and then I just wanted to add one facet that we haven't really spoken about here much and that we've, we've done quite a lot of work in Cape Town. Um, we've worked with notions of, of co-production of research and co-production not only um, so not only in the in the doing of the research, but also in developing of research agendas. Um, that I think is a difference to a lot of what is called participatory action research, um, where the agendas are often very much still dictated by the researchers or the research, research institutions, institutions, although the research then gets done in, diff in a different way. So I think one aspect of, of embeddedness mm. of research mm. can be and, and is very powerful, I think, mm. in, in our experience. Mm. The actually, the bringing together of the research expertise, the practice expertise, the policy mm. expertise in thinking about mm. so what is worth researching and mm. how do you best do that. Mm. Lucy? Hello everybody, I'm Lucy Gilson from UCT. I wanted to firstly suggest there are two characteristics of embedded research that are important in thinking about validity and rigor. And they are the ability to contextualize what you're seeing and understanding, and secondly, the long-term perspective on tracking change over time. Um, and I think both of those dimensions are incredibly important to, uh, that add huge value to, to the work that is done. I wanted to follow up on some of the other points with respect to how we take action in relation to embedded research. What sorts of networks are needed? Because if you are like Tulani, uh, uh, an insider researcher, and Rajani, insider researchers, what networks do you need to support action to be taken on the basis of the work you're doing? And the same would be true for, for my ODF friends in the room. Um, on the other hand, if you are an embedded researcher who is more from the research community engaging with the system, or from civil society engaging with communities and or the system, mm. what sort of networks do we need mm. in order to seek to bring about change in mm. the system on the basis of the work that we're doing? Mm. The third point I wanted to, to ask people about, on the panel or otherwise, is, you know, is embedded research um, uh, a northerner's term for the work that southerners do? And that's why it's not used in law. Papi? Papi? Thank you. Uh, I think uh, my input would be that, again, it depends on who's commissioning the research. Obviously, if it's an embedded research, the authorities within the organization may commission the research themselves. Mm -hmm. Although my view is that uh, there might be a lot of conditions that will be attached to the research. Of course, I see this as a limitation, you know, to, to research. But I just want to check because we are in a country where a lot is happening. Mm. You know. At what stage do we say the researcher observes the ethics vis-a-vis -vis 
a contribution to the broader public value. You know, what moral obligations is the researcher having in terms of revealing the information that is there? And how do you strike the balance between ethics and the moral obligations? Okay. Um, when um, uh, Helen asked about this, what is this non-embedded research? Let's start at the other end. Rajani? Yes. So, uh, I respond to a few of the... Thank you. Uh, I think this question about who is a non-embedded researcher, and I can only draw from uh, experiences in India, is when various groups work at the sub-district level investigating a certain program, not commissioned by the system, and go out and publish it without ever having disseminated either the groups with which they interact in the community or at the policy level, if at all they do, to me that would seem a little bit like non-embedded research. It doesn't contribute to, yes, it contributes to some knowledge, maybe some concepts, theory, <coughs> frameworks, but not exactly relevant to either the immediate people that they worked with or to the policies of that region. So that would be my distinction between embedded and non-embedded research. To come to David's question about, does this take into question the, uh, the power relationships between the researchers and the policy makers? I think in embedded research, at least the way I understand it, is that the fact that the questions are being framed, maybe they're being framed with some kind of agenda in mind, but they are important questions for the health system in that particular context at that particular time. They're posed by policy makers and there's this joint work between researchers and implementers perhaps makes it a little more easy. I'm not saying it's completely easy, and I think it's an incremental process. There will be times with why policymakers will not agree with what the researchers find, and maybe that study will never get published or get attention that it deserves, but I think it's an incremental process. I certainly think, in India at least, there is movement towards accepting this kind of research far more than they accept RCTs conducted by some other some other mm. university from somewhere, even within the country coming and doing this kind of research. Mm. So I think that this notion about co-production, creating a research agenda with policy makers and practitioners of that particular area will have far more, despite the unpalatable results at some point, the co-production and the agreement to a joint research agenda really has a lot of merit and I think that should be the starting point for doing this kind of research. And finally, uh, Lucy's question about what networks do we need. I think in, my, in our case, the networks that we rely on most are the networks of implementers and networks of civil society. I think bridging the gap between those two groups helps us with a lot of advocacy to uh, disseminate and make sure that the findings of embedded research get reflected back mm. into the system. Mm. Any of you? If we... Okay, I'll, I'll go next. Um, we, we need networks which will give us jobs when we have been fired. <laughs> uh, fired for disclosing things that we took an oath not to disclose. <laughs> uh, I don't know on a serious note, I think I, I agree with Rajan. Uh, I think research, uh, embedded research, not only about discovering new things, new information, it's also about implementation of what has been discovered. So I think there we, we need to, to work together. But I think also issues of, of <coughs> framing, framing of things. Mm. Um, I might be biased because um, I'm from inside government, and therefore how I present issues always favors government. But working in partnership with academic and research institutions, they might help me uh, to see different perspectives. Uh, acknowledging what you just said, that there's nothing like being objective. We are all subjective to an extent in the way we see reality. But having said that, framing things that uh, are more balanced and you know, take uh, both, both, both perspectives to, together. I, I, I think the the issue that uh, Mr. Babi Marani raises, uh, it's, it's an issue of the, the moral dilemmas that were, I spoke about when he asked, asked that ethical mm. and moral dilemma. Because the question is asking is, uh, how do you balance the need to inform public, broader society, vis-a-vis um, -vis the, the notion of a, an embedded researcher who has 
focused or agreed to focus on working with the system internally. Mm. So uh, there are two things. I think you, you can't be independent and affiliated at the same time. So are you an independent researcher or are you an affiliated researcher? <laughs> because if you're affiliated, then there are rules of association mm. which you know, have to be, to be observed. And perhaps there are documents that were agreed upon at the beginning of the study about how the dissemination of results is going to occur. Now, a, a quick illustration of what Mr. Gawara is saying. You, you are conducting an expenditure review, mm. and you've agreed with the institution that your findings are going to be presented to the institution first. Mm. In the process of conducting the expenditure review, you discover fraud. <coughs> Some fraud has happened. Do you still report your findings to the institution as agreed, or do you go to the meeting? So, question of the key issue becomes what did you agree at the onset of the study? Because otherwise, you are, all, you are violating your own ethical undertakings, which were that you are going to report the findings to this institution. You didn't say, I'm going to report them if they are positive, and if they are negative, I'm going to go to the meeting. It's about integrity. Mm. Yeah, I, th I think it's about issues of I integrity and conducting research ethically. Mm. My, my last point, Madam Facilitator. Uh, Professor Davis and the is very important for it, and I think um, what uh, Professor Uttaraman has said helps to address some of those issues. In, in Africa, we have been researched to death, you know. Mm. We have been researched to death, and we have not been co-producers of knowledge. Mm. And, and why this is taken for granted in Europe is that the research has been done in partnerships, maybe, maybe the notion of ensuring that people who participate in the research are equal partners, they co-produce knowledge, and that at the end of the day, the rest of the society sees that as co-production, meaning as embedded. In that context, you can say everything is embedded because it's been done that way. Mm. But like Rajan has said, you have had many instances where people come to an institution, collect data, and leave. Mm. Or collect data, and the role of the respondent is just to provide information. Mm. Right? You are not a core member of the research team. You are not a co-owner of the knowledge produced. You are not necessarily a co-publisher of the product that will emerge from, from there. I think the issue of a period research also assists us to move away from such things. Mm. Mm. Uh, Charles um, and Miguel in particular, this whole issue of what did David say? Who has power in this bed? Who has the power in this bed? Miguel, you you sounds like the way, uh, the developed world has been doing this for a long time. So you, what's your perspective? Who has the power? <laughs> uh, <laughs> always the rich have the power. <laughs> here and there. Mm. Um, no, I, some comments, I don't know if I will address exactly that one. But mm. uh, yeah, I, I don't think all high-income countries are the same. Mm. So that's one, one point. I mean, I belong to two, two different high-income countries, and though, both of them are completely different in the way they understand research and the way they understand the, the health systems. So that's one kind of uh, comment. Um, I, I mean, a bit about Helen as well. Uh, I, I don't know if there is, as I mentioned at the beginning for me, that, uh, that uh, label of, uh, of embedded didn't exist. So, so I'm not sure if it will exist now. But uh, um, uh, in order so I cannot make this distinction. For me, again, the main issue here is on what kind of uh, and, and yeah, what kind of research question do we have, and, and what kind of uh, I mean, and what's the ways that I want to to initiate in order to change or to transform uh, the, the particular system? Uh, I'm not sure if we have to do more embedded research in order to transform the system, because in order to do that, you have to have uh, certain characteristics in a particular system, the health system, but as well a governmental <coughs> system. Um, and, and therefore, I, I think it's, that's why I think it's very important. The issue I think mentioned by Charles as well about what kind of uh, institutional context are you uh, embedded mm. uh, in overall and like a macro, but as well and a micro, mm. because you might have a very excellent research, embedded research, but with uh, impact zero, 
or, uh, and then it's better to do uh, a non-embedded research in order to have some impact. Mm -hmm. And that's why I think it's very important that uh, the, 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 yeah, the institutional context and how you think that the, what you are going to do and that the research is relevant for, for something. Uh, I wanted to link to the issue as well a bit of co-production research and, and our small experience. We work a little, I mean, we work quite a lot with uh, the National Institute of Public Health in Sweden. Uh, and then I think this is a kind of source of co-production in the sense that uh, they come to us, they, we sit in a table, then we discuss a particular problem that they, a particular need that they have. Uh, and through all the, 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 the whole process of a particular research, they share as well a lot of the ideas about what, how they are going to use that research for. Mm. So we have certain idea that, okay, they are doing this. In this particular case, for instance, we are involved in, as mentioned before, migration and sexual and reproductive health. But we know from them that they want this research in order to make a change. Mm. So in order to do an intervention later and that they become something later. So in that sense, uh, I think uh, there is this kind of space for uh, co-production of, of research. Uh, something that we might mm. not call embedded. Mm. So, so Charles, um, David was talking about um, this whole notion of the ability to make a change. I, I think it was um, David who, who made that point, that sometimes even the policy makers, after they receive the, the, um, the research findings, are sometimes not able to make a change. Do you think that maybe we should be going further I mean, currently when you do a, a research protocol, it almost ends at the point of dissemination. Do you think that maybe that gives an opportunity for us to go even further and almost think about, before we even do the research, how exactly the, the translation from um, uh, the findings to policy and practice should be done? Or what do you think? Uh, yeah. Uh, I'm not sure. I, I, I agree with you. I think we need to think about the entire process. Mm. Of course, uh, change happens at various levels. Let me link this to the, uh, the comment that came on the co production of research. I think the comment was uh, we think of co production at doing level, at uh, agenda setting. Um, but I want to add to say we should be doing. Uh, co-production, not just at that level, but also at an analysis level, uh, a participatory analytical uh, approaches. And the reason I say so is because uh, uh, you can use the different lens and you come up with a different timing and another person uses another lens. Um, but we want to, be, want to have be participatory at all these levels. But the fourth level is that I think we need to have a participatory approach also at an uh, advocacy level, at the engagement mm. level. Mm. Now we do a lot of this primary research, and uh, actually we hardly do any research on what advocacy works, mm. in what context, mm. for who, and for where. Mm. And, and we don't even have those skills. And so then we leave the last point as a failure point. And so for that reason, um, uh, when we miss it at that level, uh, it comes uh, I come to comment on, on David is who has the power to change. Mm. So the moment you miss it there, then you also miss on who really should the power be given to. And I mm. think it's uh, uh, my colleague from the Tamara has been talking about the citizen empowerment, mm. citizen power. And mm. so we think that mm. this information ends with us or in mm. the application domain. Mm. But we need to find a way to translate this mm. to groups you know, in, in various communities. Mm. Um, uh, the HIV story and treatment is one case in point. Many of you will recall that, uh, you know, and, and, and not a long time ago, we were told that the drugs will not be available to people because they are expensive. Mm. And some of that we have made by the AIDS conference in, 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 in Bangkok could remember how civil society broke in and turned the tables and demanded for what was right, mm. because the information was there. So we need to find a way in which we can have this information and translate to groups that can rise up and demand the right. Mm. In Zambia, we, 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 we tried to put up a, uh, a, a, a bill of rights in the last election and mm. mess it up. But that was with a view to make ourselves accountable to each other, mm. 
to the extent that we should be able to prosecute morally, ethically, but also legally mm. on when we do the wrong things. Mm. In summary, we need to translate this power, the knowledge, and to people who know where this matters. So if you have a research finding and you cannot explain it to a garden boy, and then you don't yet have a conclusion. Mm. Walter, you wanted to make a comment? <coughs> yes. Uh, I think in all the presentation, the example, it just, it just came to my head that probably we should not also talk about embedded research like a, a generic or homogeneous term, mm. because it will depend what kind of research also is being embedded. Mm. For instance, some research doing embedded will be less controversial or generate less steering of power relation than, than others. Mm. For instance, in our case, the examples that I've been given, because my institution works around governance and particularly transparency and accountability of decision making, mm -hmm. one of the centers of our research is the non-formal mechanism of process influencing public decision making. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So any research that we're going to do around that is going to create con controversy. Mm -hmm. That's why my example had to do with all these issues because controversy. Mm -hmm. As if I were to be doing something else with an administrative routine that may not create controversy. Mm -hmm. And in light of, uh, based on that, I, I just want to give an example whether we agree it's embedded research or not. Uh, for instance, we work with communities that use the services. We have a, a website in which they can report and send a message about problems and complaints. Mm. And they have been going on for several years. Everybody knows that the system, especially frontline healthcare providers, but we got already several of the organized healthcare pro frontline healthcare providers have approaches to say that if we can help them out with setting a similar system for frontline healthcare workers that they want to send complaints, they want to set about problems that they see with the management and deployment of health workforce. Mm. And we told them, but why don't you say it in the system? No, because we cannot say that. We're going to get fired, we complain, this kind of thing. Mm. Mm. So they are, uh, they are part of the system, they are healthcare workers, they have been for a long while, and it is an issue that they are raising up. Mm. We want to address this issue. Mm. Is it that embedded research? Oh, no, mm. they are seeking a civil society organization as the as the the one that can help us to bring this issue to light. But mm. can we call the embedded research or not, for instance? Because mm. as I'm saying, they are the one they're going to provide information that mm. we are just giving the mechanism mm. to bring that all to light and to mm. help them now to analyze how those mm. mechanisms are influencing decision making mm. and so forth. Mm. So, so I'm just going to leave it there to say that. It is a lot more complex than just mm. using the term embedded research, mm. but as I'm saying, well, but what kind of research? Is it a research that is generating potential controversy mm. or not? And is it a research that may, may be shaking up power relations within the, the, mm. the, mm. within the health system, mm. which may lead to a, a to different situations, all to different approaches? Mm. No, thank you very much to my esteemed panel. I think that is a a nice place to, to stop the conversation. Kind of, we started off saying that, oh, we've done this before, it's just a change in term. But as we've been discussing, and if there were students here who were thinking, I might like to do embedded research, I'm sure some of you are already thinking, hmm, I'm not so sure anymore. It does sound like something that is not for the faint-hearted, I think as Tulane said, something that has to be, that requires certain types of skills. And importantly, I think also from the health system side, it does require skills and competency from that side to also engage. But I think also, I mean, the researchers also need to almost have a lead time on how to engage with the managers because you don't want lone rangers. So thank you very much, colleagues, and everybody else. I hope you've had some food for thought and that this has been an enjoyable afternoon for you. Thank you, and have a good afternoon. Oh, sorry. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. It was a fantastic panel, and I'm just jumping in to take opportunity to announce um, the release of a book that I'm Asha George, I'm here at the School of Public Health at UWC, and UWC led with several other people, funded by the Alliance, this reader on health policy and systems, research approaches on human resources for health. That's a very long title, but it's to highlight that health workers are key parts of the health system, and looking at different ways of 
engaging with research that raises their agency and looks at them and other key stakeholders as key parts of supporting and transforming health systems. So we have the book out, it's on the Alliance website. They have the PDF on the website, they have individual chapters, if, you're not, if you don't want to download the whole book, and they should also have PowerPoints for each of the chapters. Um, we have a few copies here, but they're big and heavy, and it's up there on the website for everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Asha. Uh, yeah. Thanks, Asha. So, also, I'd just like to thank Tracy for agreeing to moderate our panel. And Intellectual food for thought, so we're offering a cup of tea to wash that down <laughs> outside. So please join us. Thank you, everybody. That was really interesting.